Our ranking member will be here momentarily, so we have about two minutes. And uh, usually, I, uh, if we have someone from Texas here, I usually ask them to use up the special extra time that we have uh, telling us about the great state of Texas, but uh, we don't have one with us today, so. <laughs> so I can, but we have Victor David Hansen who can tell us about uh, the great state of California. <laughs> Go past, all right.
whereas I have been informed uh, that uh, the ranking member will be here momentarily and have been given permission by the staff, uh, oh, and by, by Ms. Kelly as well, that we can proceed and he will be joining us. So, uh, good afternoon. I call this hearing to order. The subcommittee's topic for this afternoon is mass migration in Europe. Its history, the current reality, the consequences of migration, and what those consequences mean to the transatlantic relationship. Uh, let me say that <clears throat> from the start, uh, what this hearing is not, and it is not and cannot simply be a discussion of recent Syrian refugees going pouring into Europe. Yes, that is part of the discussion, but it is only one part of the discussion. This is a big topic, one with a history which stretches back decades and uh, in terms of migration, uh, perhaps uh, even centuries. Uh, we cannot do justice to the issue or the lives of all the people affected without being respectful of the history of what we're talking about today. In recent history, European uh, demographics uh, began to change dramatically after the Second World War. The continent, depleted of manpower after the war, turned to a guest workers program from Turkey, Morocco, Algeria, and elsewhere. That was for labor to rebuild their countries destroyed during the war. Additionally, as Europe's colonial empires came apart, that too spurred migration from Africa, the Asian subcontinent, and the Middle East. Uh, both the collapse of the Soviet Union and the implosion of Yugoslavia brought new migrants uh, who sought safety, education, jobs, and re re being reunited with their families. Uh, in 2015, famine and collapsing economies in the Middle East and Africa, as well as the wars in Syria and in the Middle East, caused a spike in migration, bringing more than one million people into Europe some of them fleeing ISIS, uh, or uh, some of them uh, just desperate to get, uh, get away from the horrible conditions in refugee camps. Others came seeking employment and a means to support their families. A small portion of those who entered Europe came with bloody and radical intentions. Very small percentage, very small number of these people were terrorists. That, too, will be part of the discussion. While the 2015 wave uh, has tapered off, the ramification from that event are still with us today. Politically, it has damaged solidarity within the European Union, as some states have rejected the Berlin-Brussels position on geographically redistributing asylum seekers throughout Europe. Uh, so it's caused some problems there, and it's also raised sensitive questions about how successful European societies have been at assimilating past groups of immigrants. It's prudent to ask, how can European societies absorb hundreds of thousands, perhaps millions, of sub-Saharan Africans and Arabs from the Middle East, many of whom are Muslims and all of whom come from a vastly different culture than the ones found in Europe, especially when reaching Europe is an achievable goal now for so many, and the mechanisms to return uh, failed asylum seekers and unlawful economic migrants is woefully insufficient or maybe even non-existent. The answers have been clear uh, and they have been also, however, unnerving to many European populations. From the, from the Brexit vote to the rise of the AFD in Germany, and yes, elections in Hungary, and uh, the rhetoric about controlling borders and maintaining cultures and preventing radicalization, all of this has been a constant. For the United States, our European NATO allies are among the most valuable partners we have. Uh, their reduced unity and increased political instability do not serve our interests. However, this hearing will shed some light on constructive ways 
uh, that we can approach the challenges that we're talking about. I will now turn to Mr. Meeks, who's not here. Uh, maybe Ms. Kelly, do you have an opening statement? Okay, and uh, we'll find a way to mark time until Meeks gets here, but we will not. I will instead introduce all of the witnesses and uh, 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 starting number one with uh, uh, Dr. Victor Davis Hansen, uh, a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University. He is a scholar of classics and military history and having written nearly uh, two dozen books, his latest is A History of the Second World War, a book which is right on my desk, ready, ready to be read, and it's been there for a couple weeks, I might add, <laughs> waiting for me. I appreciate that you've traveled all the way from California to be with us today and to share with us uh, your understanding of this and this and put in perspective to the history of what we're talking about. Uh, we also have with us uh, uh, Dr. Marta uh, Verbich. What? Verbatich. 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 I'm sorry. I'm, I get it mixed screwed up all the time. I, my hearing aid's wrong today, so. Ver, Verbatich. Okay. All right. Now, with a name like Rohrbacher, no one ever mispronounces my name, I will tell you. So, anyway, well, we're very happy to have you with us today. Uh, you, uh, you are a fellow with the Global uh, Europe Program within the Woodrow Wilson Center. Previously, uh, you were an ambassador, or an assistant professor, that is, of government at uh, uh, Galadut, Galadut University. Uh, and she is an expert on European politics and conflict resolution. Uh, Robin Sin Sincox is a Margaret Thatcher uh, fellow at the Heritage Foundation. He is widely published uh, and uh, an expert on counterterrorism and counter radicalism. And I'm happy he's uh, with us today, as, serving as a witness. And finally, now I'm going to try to pronounce this correctly too. I failed so far, <laughs> but here goes. Uh, Whale Al Zat. Got it. <laughs> okay. Uh, He's the CEO of the, uh, is it M, 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 the what foundation? MGH. Okay, got it. An organization that advocates for Muslim Americans. And uh, he has had a distinguished career at the State Department, serving in the U.S. Embassy in Iraq, uh, the U.S. Mission to the United Nations, and the department's Syria Outreach Coordinator. I want to thank all of you for being with us today, and uh, should we proceed? All right. Okay. Uh, I would ask the witnesses to summarize uh, your testimony into five minutes. Anything you want to say more than that, you can put right into the record. We'll be put into the record, and then we will uh, also get to a more extensive uh, dialogue uh, once the questions begin. So, Mr. Sim, Simcox. Thank you, um, Chairman Rohrabacher and distinguished members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify here today. Uh, my name's Robin Simcox. I'm the Margaret Thatcher Fellow at the Heritage Foundation. Um, the views I express in this testimony are my own and do not represent any official position of the Heritage Foundation. My goal this afternoon is to highlight um, some of the challenges Europe will face in the future due to both historic and more recent decisions on mass migration. First are the security concerns related to recently arrived asylum seekers and refugees. The Islamic State of Iraq and al-Sham, or ISIS, is known to have infiltrated Europe using the unprecedented refugee flow. This was particularly common in 2015 when Chancellor Merkel opened up Germany's borders. Yet its ideology has also proven attractive to recent arrivals into Europe who were not previously part of the ISIS orbit. Forthcoming heritage research documents the impact that the recent influx of refugees and asylum seekers has had on European security. Since January 2014, either refugees, asylum seekers, or those exploiting the migrant routes into Europe have been involved in dozens of separate plots in Europe leading to hundreds of deaths and injuries, including that of American citizens. 
the majority of these plots had direct ties to ISIS. Furthermore, the plots took place throughout Western Europe with Germany the number one target. The perpetrators uh, came from a broad variety of countries, but most commonly from Syria. Several individuals even had their asylum applications rejected, but were unfortunately not immediately deported, and this includes those who carried out the vehicular attacks in Berlin and in Stockholm. Second are concerns over the doctrine of state multiculturalism in Europe. This doctrine accepts that different cultures will live segregated lives with no expectation to integrate, leading to the development of separate parallel societies with competing laws and customs. In the UK, for example, there are dozens of Sharia councils. They adjudicate on a variety of civil issues, including Sharia compliant financial advice and resolving family disputes. These councils operate legally under British civil law. However, one recent UK government report carried out uh, for the Home Office determined that these councils are encroaching on legal matters outside their purview. So this report state that stated that there are now an estimated 100,000 Sharia marriages without state recognition, meaning that women do not have the legal rights they should under UK law. Certain Sharia councils were also adjudicating on child custody and domestic violence issues. The Home Office report went on to highlight, quote, claims that some Sharia councils have been supporting the values of extremists, condoning wife beating, ignoring marital rape, and allowing forced marriage, end quote. Thirdly, mass immigration can also adversely affect foreign policy. In January 2014, The Guardian reported that senior officials in the UK's Ministry of Defence had assessed that the reality of an increasingly multicultural Britain could influence future strategic defence decisions. These Ministry of Defence officials cited worries that British troops had largely been deployed to Muslim-majority countries in recent years, such as Afghanistan and Iraq. There were concerns about deploying troops in the future to countries which British citizens or their families had historic ties. This was an acknowledgement that UK policy could see strategic interests abroad sacrificed for domestic security interests at home. And despite the recent modest contributions to US military actions in Syria, there is nonetheless the possibility of future constraints on the US's closest allies. Chairman Rabak and uh, distinguished members of the subcommittee, the humanitarian situation many refugees flee from is of course horrific. Syria especially epitomizes this. Nations wishing to adopt a policy of controlled migration in response is entirely understandable. Furthermore, the concerns I have referred to in Europe do not exist solely because of the most recent inflow. Europe has struggled with integration and domestic security concerns for decades. Yet the most recent inflow has unfortunately exacerbated these problems. As a possible solution, European governments could more rigorously vet asylum seekers, commit more resources to counter-terrorism, be more willing to deport those in Europe illegally, and place an expectation on newcomers that they integrate into their new environment and respect core European values. Thank you for inviting me today, and I look forward to your questions. Dr. Verbetic. I will be speaking in my own name, and the opinions expressed in my testimony should not be understood as reflecting the official views of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. Since I have only five minutes, I will go and talk about the most important um, issues that I find, how European politics is changing, what impact might be on a transatlantic relationship. Um, and if I have time, I will go back to the Balkans and the impact of the crisis on the Balkans in, in 2015. First of all, as you mentioned, the anti-establishment and far-right uh, parties are gaining ground in Europe. As we have seen the recent victories, uh, electoral victories in Austria, Italy, and Germany, Chancellor Merkel took its centrist conservative party to the left, and some of her supporters defected to the far-right alternative for Germany, AFD. Um, 
and with just 13% of the national vote, AFD has been able to disrupt German politics, making it more difficult, for example, for Chancellor Merkel to form the new government. I should also say that Russia has been supporting some far-right politicians in Europe and probably is doing so in order to increase divisions within Europe and upset the established governments. Uh, recently, the United States, joined by France and United Kingdom, launched airstrikes against Syria. The German chancellor said the action was appropriate but didn't join the allies in taking the action due to the opposition at home. Basically, the migration crisis and everything that followed left the German chancellor weaker. And we see here how uh, the transformation of European politics could possibly have impacts on transatlantic relationship. Furthermore, European leaders are beginning to worry about the possibility of devastating far-right attacks, which could potentially radicalize Muslims, provoke more attacks by radicalized immigrants and far-right groups, and lead to the breakdown of law and order. I'm referring to potential hypothetical scenario uh, developed by the EU Institute for Security Studies, which reflects some of the concerns um, in Europe right now. Migration has also become a big source of contention in Europe between the new democracies in the East and the Western counterparts, especially over how to reallocate 160,000 asylum seekers from Greece and Italy. The Visegrad four countries, Hungary, Czech Republic, Slovakia, and Poland remain opposed they insist that the EU should protect its borders and prevent migratory pressures rather than distribute the asylum seekers. Germany and Western European states insist on solidarity and burden sharing. Um, also, um, I will now, uh, because I have uh, very little time left, I will go to what the United States can do and is doing to help Europe. First of all, the United States and NATO should continue disrupting the smuggling and trafficking across the Mediterranean. Thereby, they're helping protect European borders. Second, there should be no repetition of the experience we've seen in 2015, when a million migrants virtually unvetted made it to the heart of Europe. Besides posing security risks and some of the Paris attackers pass through the refugee shelters in the Balkans. So besides posing security risks, the migration influx was destabilizing the Western Balkans and Southeast Europe and causing lots of um, uh, quarrels among the countries that are still unstable and still have neighborhood disputes. Um, the United States should also urge Europeans to put their differences aside. Eastern Europeans look up to the United States of America, and we should urge them to end their present quarrels with their Western counterparts. Eastern Europeans should embrace solidarity and accept the need to shape the common asylum policies in Europe. Western Europeans need to stop talking down to Eastern Europeans and be ready to examine their failing integration policies at home. Um, I'm over the time, therefore I will end here, and there will be more opportunity for discussion. Thank you. I'll try to summarize very briefly my written statement. Uh, Chairman Rosherbacher. And, um, Hold the microphone oh, a little closer. Me, We're having yeah. a little Is that volume better? problem there. Okay. And Representative Kelly. Uh, what we see now is the largest group of uh, potential migrants since World War II and the displaced persons that were a result of the invasion of Russia in 1941 and the Russian counteroffensive. And it, it's a pull of 60 to 65 million people would like to leave Asia, Africa, or Latin America. So it, it's what we've seen is maybe the tip of the iceberg. There's a commonality uh, that we share in the United States with Europe. It's always, almost always, a non-Western to a Western phenomenon. 
that is the former British Commonwealth, the United States and Europe, have a greater propensity for consensual government, free market economics, transparency in the judiciary, and that attracts people who want to enjoy that atmosphere. Most of the people arriving, unfortunately, are coming under illegal auspices. They tend to not have language fluency in the host country in which they arrive. They're not often a, a diverse group of people. They tend to be concentrated from a particular country or region, and they're coming, and I said, unprecedented numbers. They cause a lot of political uh, ramifications on the host country. Politically, the divide is often progressives who uh, are at least stereotyped more sympathetic to social welfare programs or more sympathetic. Conservatives that are worried about tradition and customs are more skeptical. But more importantly, there's a class divide. The elites who tend to favor open borders, if I could use that term, through their influence and power are often uh, immune from the ramifications of their own ideology. And the lower and middle class uh, native citizens deal with the problem firsthand. And that's caused a rise of populist movements, both left and right in Europe and the United States. There's also a, a little bit of chauvinism on their arrival because the demography is much uh, more fertile, sometimes three to four uh, uh, replacement numbers rather than 1.4 or five in Europe or two, not even two in the United States. And that tends to suggest that you hear this term demography is destiny and it's a very Orwellian situation where the arrival starts to dictate to the host that they, they are the future of the country. Let me just quickly say, we in the United States are very fortunate because we have about twice the number of migrants. We have a higher, per double the percentage of non-native born, but we have a much stronger tradition of the melting pot. Americans are racially, ethnically, and religiously diverse. You can't identify American by his appearance in the way that Austrians or Greeks are. Um, we have a country. Europe is a confederation, and the Schengen uh, Agreement, area agreement, the Dublin, are not as successful in creating a uniform approach to the problem. We have one border that's porous. Europe has many borders, east and southern, and land and sea. Anybody who's been to the Dodecanese Island and seen what's happening. We in America, most of the people who are coming have the same faith as the host population, Christianity. That's not true in Europe with the Islamic difference and disconnect. People arriving to Europe are more inordinately male about 65 percent. Ours are about 55 percent. Males t historically are the root of most problems, especially as the younger they are. Let me just conclude by suggesting there are strategic ramifications for the United States that we often, and I don't want to repeat what Mr. Simcox so eloquently pointed out, w uh, which I'm in agreement with, but NATO is no longer uh, using a draft. Only two countries are left. It's a volunteer army. Experience shows usually when you have a volunteer army, you the people from the newer arriving classes or the less economically successful will join the military and that will have a larger number of immigrants. Secondly, the European, only six countries in Europe are meeting their 2% goals of GDP and with this increased social costs, whether it's actual or psychological, they'll be less reluctant, more reluctant to meet their commitments. Germany has been the historic leader of Europe, and it's really suffering somewhat uh, being discredited after the financial north-south uh, divide in Europe, and then the Brexit divide, of which in both cases Germany was at the fore. They are creating a great uh, level of animosity, especially from Eastern Europeans who are felt that they have been condescended to by German leadership. And I think this has enormous security ramifications for the United States if Germany is not a credible leader of the EU and the EU itself is not able without a, strong, a stricter political framework to address this. And we really see an EU now cut not in half north-south but in four ways. And then finally, uh, we have strong ties to Israel and if we know now that the level of perceptible anti-Semitism is rising and there's been an out-migration to Israel. That has uh, security ramifications for the United States and that is, I think, a mostly a result of incoming uh, arrivals. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, uh, Mr. Or Mr. And now I get this, is it Wales, I'll yeah. 80% there. Okay, go for it. Uh, Chairman Rohrabacher, uh, honorable members, thanks for having me here today. My name is Wael Al-Zayat. I'm CEO of Engage, which is a civic education and 
engagement organization for Muslim and minority communities. Uh, as was mentioned earlier, uh, I served for 10 years at the Department of State on Iraq, Syria, and, and a lot of the other easy to deal with countries that we're all discussing. Uh, I served under some incredible diplomats, including uh, Ambassador Samantha Power, Ambassador Jim Jeffrey in Baghdad twice, and I worked with Ambassador Robert Ford on the very difficult Syrian crisis for, five year, for three years. Um, so I hope what I'm sharing with you here is understood as my personal professional reflection based on what I've seen firsthand. Um, as been mentioned, there are approximately 65 refugees worldwide, uh, the largest since World War II. And I know we don't want to dwell just on Syria, but it was the Syrian crisis that led to a 40% spike after 2011 in that number. And, and that's a really um, in terms of the, the annual uh, displacement. And Syrians right now are the largest number of refugees, over 5 million. And it's important to understand how we got here just very quickly. It was the escape from terrorist organizations, but mainly from the brutality of the Assad regime, which was cited by most refugees as the reason for their displacement. Most Syrians that I've spoken with and dealt with had no intention of leaving their countries and wish they were still there had they not been literally barrel bombed out of their homes. And we've seen also, um, uh, you know, subjugated to other means of torture, including chemical weapons, et cetera, et cetera. Um, on top of that, it was really the Russian intervention in Syria in 2015 that led to an increase in that displacement on top of the existing displacement. In fact, the same year Russia entered the conflict in Syria, 1.2 million first-time asylum seekers applied in Europe, twice the number of the year before. So there's a direct correlation there. So if we're serious about stemming the flow of refugees into Europe, then part of the answer lies in civilian protection in Syria and other countries that are hemorrhaging people. Now, with this latest wave of migration, there's completely understandable anxiety. It's normal. The world is shrinking. It feels like it's shrinking. Uh, and not always in a good way. Now, but there, 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 we need to level set a little bit. Um, when we look at the terrible phenomena of terrorist strikes and attacks in Europe, the majority have been done actually by European citizens, not by immigrants and not by refugees. In fact, according to my research, and I'm not an expert in this field, but this is my research, um, from January 2016 to April 2017, only four asylum seekers, four, were involved in terrorist attacks. So something else is going on here. Now, clearly the European project has not been as successful in integrating its Muslim refugees and migrants as we have here. That's clear to me. Um, but why? There's a lot of reasons being cited here, but we cannot neglect the institutional discrimination in public sphere, and particularly in the job market, combined with strict interpretation of what it means to be a citizen. This has alienated particularly second and third generation children of immigrants who feel disconnected from the only country they know. But regardless of all of this, European Muslims are very young. Over half is under the age of 30. These are the continent's future if they are engaged and empowered, and we know they're already attached to their societies. For example, 76% speak the local European language as their native language. 75% regularly intermingle with non-Muslims. And they identify with the host country. The identification is increasing over time. But more importantly, 94% said they felt connected to the country they lived in. These are Muslims in Europe. With the near defeat of ISIL on the battlefield, it's more important than ever to distinguish its nihilist ideology. It has to be defeated. But this requires engagement and tolerance rather than demonization and bigotry. It requires trust building between law enforcement and local communities. It requires creating equal opportunity for everyone and requires respect for people regardless of their faith and treating them as equal citizens. I know much is being you know, usually said about the Judeo-Christian values. I can tell you that you can't have Judeo-Christian values without Islamic values. They're inherently the same. They worship the same God and follow the teachings of the same prophets. 
Perhaps the best model of integration is right here at home, where religious freedom is guaranteed by the Constitution and citizens are not asked to choose between their faith and being American. According to Pew Research here in 2017, Muslim Americans overwhelmingly say they are proud to be Americans, believe that hard work generally brings success in this country, and are satisfied with the way things are in their own lives, despite a 100% increase in hate crimes against Muslims since 2014. I myself, I am one of those proud Americans who is also an immigrant and a Muslim and a Syrian. It is the belief in the ideals of America where we are judged by what we do rather than the color of our skin that gave me the impetus to become a public servant and the privilege to work on some of our country's most challenging national security issues. I fear those ideals are under assault. I personally feel that the real challenges, the emerging challenges facing Europe and elsewhere, it's not the refugees or the migrants. It's the willful abandonment of our cherished values of tolerance and equality under the law. I hope we can all work together on resolving some of these real pressing issues together in a constructive manner for the sake of our country, our European allies, and really the world. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Very nice to have you Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And good afternoon, everyone. I apologize for being a little tardy. But I want to thank Chairman Raubacher for calling our attention to an ongoing concern of ours as we look at Europe from this side of the Atlantic. Large migration flows into Europe, including from majority Muslim countries, is not a new phenomenon. But let us remember the flows from the Middle East, Turkey, uh, in the 50s and the 60s, and from the Balkans and Iraq in the 90s. So although I know we will inevitably talk about Chancellor Merkel's decision on Dublin as a pivotal moment, I would like for us to keep in mind the changing nature of European populations throughout the 20th century and earlier. Some facts have changed, but we've been here before. I also cannot help but comment on our own changing refugee policies here in the United States. As the world rapidly becomes a smaller place where transcontinental threats affect us all, the Trump administration is acting, in my, belie in my uh, belief, in an incomprehensible manner by bombing Syria when he sees fit, not solving the problem, and tightening our refugee policy here at home, a policy that I might add has been very successful. Our refugee policies and mechanisms, by the way, can teach other societies, including those in Europe, best practices. Before we criticize Europe for trying to integrate refugees from bloody massacres in Syria, or often from regions where we are directly involved, I suggest we reflect a bit on what it means when we turn away refugees. Finally, on a personal note, my family came to New York from the South, from South Carolina, in, a very difficult, in very difficult conditions that I did not quite understand as a young, young boy growing up. But they were internal migrants looking for better opportunities for their children and risked a great deal. They had to travel 12 hours from South Carolina to New York. You go 12 hours, you could be almost any place else in the world today. And although they were not escaping a conflict zone, I could not help but think of my family's experience when looking at videos of families at the Hungarian border, for example. And I understand that not all of these people are refugees. I understand that they may not have the legal rights in Europe and should be turned away after due process. But I cannot stand for treating the traveler, the lost, the impoverished, the naked, as non-human, as a disease coming, into, coming to infect the West. It pains me to see populations in Europe, political groups across Europe, and even some voices here in Congress treat fleeing migrants, all of whom went through horrendous journeys, as a political tool to scare their populations. Instead of pragmatically addressing the causes, the difficulties, and the opportunities of the situation at hand, which was what we should be doing. As Europe or the EU grapples with newly arrived migrants and integrating refugees, I see this as a test of our liberal values. Can our system, 
the one which we fought world wars and cold wars to build and protect, treat the individual, regardless of race or creed, as one with equal rights and opportunity. I believe that the United States can be an example of how to successfully integrate new citizens from faraway countries with different cultures. I proudly represent Queens, New York, which is one of the most diverse counties in all of the United States. And although I know that this may be difficult or uncomfortable for elements of European and American society to see, I nevertheless believe in our values and institutions as we move forward. Let us look to incorporate the youth and foster future leaders from all walks of life, for they will help today's leaders navigate this change. I look forward to um, questioning and listening to our panelists as we go forward, and I think that this is, uh, is, is, is not a new normal. And if we are to protect our values, our way of life, our societies, we have to have these difficult conversations about race, religion, and individual rights in a free society. I welcome this honest dialogue and hope that our transatlantic ties can only become stronger as we address the issues at hand and address them collectively. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Uh, Mr. Cicilline, do you have an opening statement that you'd like to put in? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I can't wait to hear it. <laughs> I want to thank you, Chairman Rohrbeck and Ranking Member Meeks, for holding today's hearing on mass migration in Europe and security. Over the past several years, Europe has experienced significant refugee and migrant flows as people have fled conflict and poverty in bordering regions. This population increase, coupled with horrific violent attacks, has led to heightened concerns about terrorism and crime. As we discuss this important issue, we should take care not to conflate refugees or migrants with terrorists or criminals. The vast majority of refugees who have sought shelter and protection in Europe are running from brutal dictators, fleeing environmental catastrophe, or seeking a home where they can live, contribute, and worship in peace. It's clear to me that the international community must do more to assist those in need while ensuring the safety of all. I want to thank the witnesses for your testimony about the current efforts underway in Europe, the challenges that they are facing in ways that the United States can assist our partners there. I think yesterday we heard from President Macron who identified the necessity of American leadership to shape the 21st century world order and the responsibility to stand up, this up against this tide of authoritarianism and the effort to undermine important democratic institutions that are essential to freedom and justice in our society. And I, I want to just uh, conclude by saying I strongly agree with the final witness who just testified that uh, the real challenge that we face is not refugees and migrants. It's the systematic undermining of our democratic institutions uh, and, uh, as you said, the willful abandonment of our values of tolerance and the uh, e equality and the value of and, uh, respect of human dignity. So I hope uh, that we will have a discussion that focuses on how we can promote those universal values of human dignity and respect and universal human rights and recognize that we are a nation that is renewed in every generation by immigrants and refugees, and the same happens all over the world. And with that, I thank you and yield back. I'd like to thank our witnesses and uh, thank uh, members of the subcommittee who have joined us today. Um, I'd like to just uh, get to give some fundamentals with Dr. Hansen first. Um, do you see that there, uh, you're well known for your analysis of history and, and, and a really detailed and, and in-depth knowledge of, of, of this. And well, I, I, we all agree with democratic tolerance and liberal values, but we have to realize that whether we like it or not, that's largely a Western phenomenon that doesn't exist in Africa or Asia or Latin America to the same degree it does in Europe and the United States. So we're appealing to a tradition, and that tradition has emphasized that newcomers engage in a brutal bargain. They give up something of their, we don't ask people who arrive here to give up their food or culture or religion, but we do say they have to give up something to be part of the whole, and that is to accept democratic values and tolerance. And we know from historical exempla that assimilation, integration, and intermarriage, I'm speaking as both my brothers are married to people from Mexico, it only works when immigration is measured, mostly legal, and diverse. 
And what we really want to do then is to make uh, Americans. That's number one. Number two is we do have a lot of hate crimes, but unfortunately in the United States, uh, in the last three years, most of the hate crimes have been of the anti-Semitic nature, and many of them have been the, the, the greatest perpetrator were second generation Muslim youth. And so what I'm trying to get at is that it's not just the first generation immigration. If you look at Fort Hood, if you look at Orlando, if you look at San Bernardino, if you look at the Boston Massacre, we who integrate and assimilate people much better than Europe does have failed to uh, stress the melting pot. And the salad bowl has allowed certain zealots to appeal to a second generation who is more vulnerable to separatism and chauvinism than is the first generation because they grew up with the bounty of the United States or Europe but without the struggle and the ordeal of their home country. So it's very important that we stress liberal values of tolerance to the second generation that are much more vi uh, prone to violence as we see in Europe. And, uh, and Mr. Al Zayed was quite right, it's the second generation, but the second generation is a phenomenon of m uh, massive immigration. Finally. I think all of us agree that we do a much better job with a melting pot and assimilation and integration than Europe, but we're not in a position, especially vis-a-vis -vis Europe, to dictate how they're going to run their internal affairs. What we need to do is prepare ourselves to react to maybe their mistakes or their successes. And what we're seeing now is that Europe is dividing left and right, east and west, and north and south over immigration. And Vladimir Putin, for example, is championing a chauvinistic view that has wide appeal in Eastern Europe because elites in the EU have been condescending and giving lectures to people about you have to be more tolerant, you have to be uh, more liberal minded, and yet they themselves are not subject to the ramifications because of their influence and power and wealth. It's the lower middle classes of Eastern and Central Europe that deal firsthand with this project and are the most vulnerable to propaganda coming from auto autocracies that say the Europeans don't represent you or it's failed. So it's a much more complex idea, but the idea that we can give lectures to the Europeans about their uh, French revolutionary values is not going, it's wonderful that we would try to do that and we should, but in a practical sense we have to deal with the realities that may they may make unfortunate decisions and we have to protect our security interests accordingly. <laughs> on the floor in four minutes. So uh, that's how frustrating this job can be. Uh, <laughs> uh, 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 there you go. <laughs> uh, uh, Dr. Hansen, uh, thank, you, thank you for making those points. I, uh, I wanted to, uh, look, let me just say, uh, uh, we want America and we love America for its openness and we're hoping that uh, as Dr. Hansen was indicating that what we're doing is making Americans out of them rather than having them change those fundamental values that are American and that is extremely <laughs> that relates directly to uh, the insistence on some people who are Muslims who are coming here on and as they are in London uh, demanding that they have Sharia law and that their families be governed under Sharia law uh, I'll just let you uh, have, uh, have a go at refuting that, but uh, isn't that a, a, a very legitimate concern when you have uh, a large number of Muslims coming into another country and then suggesting that they have to have the rights uh, uh, that are totally inconsistent with the, with the culture here of, of how they treat women, how they treat young girls, uh, you put in, you know, send, send them out to be married at a young age, as well as some of the other elements of Sharia law that are totally inconsistent with our beliefs of liberty. Uh, thank you for that question. You know, I mean, there's a lot to unpack, I, I think, here is, you know, there, there is the, the statement that a lot of Muslims there and here want Sharia law. Statistically speaking, most Muslims, according to most surveys, do not want Sharia law, first of all, in the countries that they're living in, particularly in Western countries. Second of all, um, we, we need to understand what Sharia law is. Sharia law is the body of religious teachings that a devout Muslim may choose to follow in their daily affairs. Um, and now we're talking here about praying, 
fasting for Ramadan. Uh, no, we're not. No, no, no but, one, but as include, you know, no one's but, complaining about that. But that, that includes. When we no, no one is. No one is complaining about that. When you're complaining so about that, about are things that go absolutely the, contrary correct. to what America is supposed to be about. But there are no indications or any evidence that Muslims in any place, whether in Britain or the United States, have insisted on undermining the existing laws or constitutions and implementing. There's, there's no evidence that that. Uh, Muslims in England are here, have insisted that their families will be, uh, uh, they will conduct themselves with their, with their young daughters, that they will be able to, to give them into uh, fixed marriages, or that, uh, or, or there have been actually, what I understand, murders of, of women who have who committed killings, adultery. That, that doesn't no, happen? Those things, no, of course they happen, and they're All horrible. Right. But we're talking about most Muslims, or a lot of Muslims, versus a minority that is extremist needs to be dealt with. Well, look, so when we're, we when we're dealing when, when we're dealing in a situation in the modern world, it doesn't take all Muslims. If you have one Muslim who goes like like in San Bernardino, where you had two Muslim immigrants who who murdered all of these social workers. Same with white supremacists. Okay, but Christians. the point is that, that that they are there and that is impacting them and resulting in this death. It doesn't mean that because they represented only a small group of Muslims. That, that we shouldn't understand that there is a psychological part of this whole equation that has led to the death of all these Americans. And I might add, uh, leads to situations in London and elsewhere where you have violence or you have activities that are going on that wouldn't go on. You don't have to say most of them want it, but if you, have, if you just have a certain number of people there that have not okay, been vetted, you say, uh, should, well, I guess that's the question. Should we be? I, I mean, you're gonna. I'm gonna give up the floor in one minute. <laughs> okay, should just, we be vetting? Should we be then vetting people who come from the Islamic world as to what things they we were? We should be vetting anybody okay. who would like to come to the United right, States. Right, but, but but that's not what this hearing. Should, this hearing isn't. Ab this hearing isn't about anybody. This hearing's about whether how we deal directly with the is Islamic immigration. Okay, so when Fine. we deal with it, when we deal with it, my say. My, do you think that we should vet uh, Muslim would-be immigrants here, as they and they should be vetted the same in Europe, to make sure that they do not want to conduct various practices? I think any immigrant to any European or Western country, including the United States, should be vetted to make sure that they have no ties with any illicit groups and do not hold any illicit views. I do, but that should be for anybody. So you do believe then that we can ask a Muslim whether or not he or she believes in uh, four wives or uh, some sort of treatment or some sort of punishment of daughters uh, other that is differentiated from sons. You think that's okay to vet them for that? We're not okay. applied deny consistently them. to deny every them, deny them. applicant. I'm fine for it. Okay. Mr. How will the gentleman yield to the question? I, I wonder if the, you have the same concerns about all of the teachings in the Bible about mixing two kinds of fabrics, about stoning it for infidelity. You know, you go through that list. Do we ask Christians whether they should denounce those teachings? Nobody practices those. Um, I would, I would suggest that. Uh, There's like thir great examples if you uh, Google I would suggest all of the have... claims that are in the Bible that people don't actually do today because if you took right. them literally cutting off the hand of your spouse, like, we, but would we make the same inquiry of Christians coming in? And Christians and Jews and everybody else who tries to come here okay, well, should be vetted and make sure. I think that's what the witness but, said. But I will suggest that uh, uh, the last time someone like that. Uh, who is an immigrant from another country who, has, uh, who, who exploded because of their deep faith in Judaism or Christianity, I don't remember any incident right now where there were deaths because well, of that. Well, I think the witness said that but, most uh, of the deaths were caused by people who were citizens of the country when they caused the attack. Okay. So that's a fact. I mean, we ought to rely on some of the Mr. evidence and not it, just can, sort of our own. Can I give, can I give the time to your oh, yeah. ranking member? So, I, I yield back. Thank you for yielding <laughs> to my right, question. Go, go right ahead. Mr. Meeks, okay, you right, have the and, floor. And, and, and I was going to let David, if you had anything else to say, because the other picture I was going to say, just about everybody in America immigrated from somewhere other than Native Americans. Mm -hmm. And I know of a group that still exists in America that was responsible for a whole lot of deaths. They're called lynchings. They're called the Ku Klux Klan. And these are Christians. 
and they believe in separation and they believe in violence. They've been very violent in this country. They've immigrated from somewhere else. And many of them were involved, not all of them, but many of them were, you know, they're still involved in the democracy called the United States of America. And so to, now I don't blame everybody that happens to be Christians and or white uh, to say that that for a minority who believe in those things, that means everybody believes that. And I think what Mr. Alzot is saying, <laughs> that there's a small minority. You can find a small minority of people of any faith, of any ethnic group, that are horrible people. But you don't go after the whole spectrum when the overwhelming majority, because it's human nature to have somebody that's evil. And we want to stomp out and make sure that the evil folks don't get in or don't stay here. But that's not because they're not evil because they're Muslim. Just like you don't say they're, you don't, they're not evil because they're evil people. And we call them who they are. But Muslims, if you look at the religion, it's a very peaceful religion. And that's what they teach. And that's how they live by. And for us to then to, to color it some other kind of way is not going to resolve issues. It's going to cause issues. And I think that what we're talking about, I mean, the fact of the matter is in the United States previously, you know, all you had to do was get here. You know, when you came into the Staten Island, you registered, they didn't care as long as you got here because they said, give me your tired, give me your, your weary, give me, you know, we want you. Except for those that were brought over in the halls of slave ships. And you, you want to give them a so question? I, I, I am. But I, you, you opened the door. I wasn't going that way at all. So there's no way in any good conscience could I sit back and just allow, you know, you know me and you are good friends. And I often have to come back <laughs> after you've made a statement. You take me off my, my game plan, and I've got to call an automatic because I've got to address it because I don't want the record to indicate that I can allow a statement that I so 180 degree disagree with to stand and to go. I don't want the record to indicate to anybody that might be listening to this hearing, who might be in this room, or who this is, this is being recorded, that Gregory Meek stood by and just allowed the kind of questioning and the statements that were just made to go without hearing my strong opposition uh, and, and, uh, 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 to, to those statements and to, the, and to what uh, was insinuated here. So, but, is, that but, to, is that to be interpreted that then you don't believe in vetting people for their religious convictions that may be violent and cause violence. I, I believe in vetting everyone, not just because of their religious beliefs. I think that as a result, I want to make sure, I don't care if you're Muslim, if you're Jewish, if you're Buddhist, if you anyone that's going to come here that you're evil and you're coming here to do harm, mm -hmm. I want to vet them. But not because you're Muslim. That's not what makes the, the, the reason why, you know, just because you're Muslim. There's Christians that commit more crime in America than anyone else. There's more Christians that commit crimes in the United States of America than any other religious belief. There's been more deaths of people who are of the Christian faith in the United States of America than any other religion. And I'm a Christian. But I'll yield a question to Ms. Uh, Kelly, and then I'm you're and then next. next. Miss Kelly, go right ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I do associate myself with the comments of the ranking member. But with the unrest in the Middle East and Russia's invasion of Ukraine, Europe has experienced increased migration flows not seen since the fall of communism. Many European countries have taken in significant numbers of refugees looking for employment and a better way of life. Many countries, however, have used the increased flows to stoke xenophobic sentiments and push anti-immigration policies. Many of these policies are aimed at Muslim populations, but countries like Poland have taken a significant number of Ukrainians. The Polish government claims to host about one million Ukrainian refugees on its territory. Many of these people are migrant workers, in in fact, filling the labor demand in a currently well-performing economy. At the same time, there's also tension 
between the local population and Ukrainians, which recalls troubling history between the two nations in the 20th century. Warsaw touts the fact that they host Ukrainians who are more like the Poles culturally as a reason to not accept Syrians. I think it's important to note that the migration issue in Europe is not just about Muslim populations. There are many different groups immigrating to Europe, reports of anti-Ukraine job postings reminiscent of the Irish need not apply are now popping up in new reports out of Poland, and yet Polish unemployment is low and the immigration wave has delayed Poland's migration aging by years. Miss, um, and I'm Verdebich? Verbetich. What type of rights do Ukrainians have when they are entering the EU as migrant workers versus refugees? And interesting and full disclosure, uh, my grandmother on my mother's side, they're Ukrainian, so half of my family is. Uh, thank you for your question. I, I'm afraid I wouldn't know the rights of Ukrainians who enter into Poland. I could research that and come back to you. I am aware, though, that, um, yes, Poland uh, has accepted many Ukrainians. Yes, I'm aware of that. Uh, can anyone else answer? I, I do have some other oh, comments, okay. if I could make to sure. this general discussion. First of all, and I'm making comments as somebody who is immigrant, can you hear me? I'm trying to speak into the mic now. Somebody who is immigrant and somebody who is, um, I was raised and born in Europe. I'm US citizen. I am uh, minority in several ways, including being completely deaf and, you know, religious minority, lots of things. So I do sympathize with many things that were expressed here. And I think we may be talking past each other. So let me tell you. The reasons why I think that the migration to uh, the solution is not just to accept everybody to come. First of all, because um, there are so many migrants, you know, we are talking about 60 million that might appear at European borders. And when I use the term migrant, I'm using as a general term. It can include asylum seekers, it could include refugees, it could include those who are seeking economic opportunity. The second thing is we are talking about the, uh, the upcoming problems in Africa uh, where uh, there will be one third of the world's youth uh, will be in Africa. And, um, and that this youth bulge is usually associated with protests and possible radicalization. There will be no jobs. There is no way that Europe can uh, absorb all of the people who want to appear on its borders. No, so know, this is the reason. I the second thing. I know you're, uh, I, I only have a certain amount of time myself, so I wanted to get another question yeah. in. I, I, I apologize. No, that's I'm okay. the first time in the hearing, so I may not no problem. fill in out the <laughs> procedure. I apologize. No Mr. Alzayak, I understand that many of migrants to the UK come from outside the EU and are not new to the UK. In fact, we're looking at second or third or fourth generation British citizens or French or Belgian who do not feel like they are fully fledged Brits. How can we work with the powers that be, the old guard in economics and politics to open doors and provide equal opportunity to all citizens? This is the tool against radicalization. What success stories have there been, if you know of? And it seems like we only focus on the negative aspects of all of this. For that question, um, you know, it's clear to me that true social integration requires investment in education and also in employment as the basic ingredients. If you look at France, they actually do a great job in education, but the labor market is, is, is overly regulated and inherently discriminatory. So you end up with well-educated minorities with no jobs. Germany does not have quite the same robust educational system, particularly for minority communities, especially in early age. However, and there are more barriers, especially because of the language, but a much more laxed and welcoming labor market. And as such, you see big difference in terms of the perception of those communities, of themselves, of the connectedness to the society, and their success and their income, which by the way, irrespective of that, it's still lower actually than 
um, the white Europeans. But so really the, the, the way forward here is to invest more in education of these children in providing job opportunities. But another piece really is, um, and it, in, in Britain this has been, uh, I think, done in the right way, Islam needs to be recognized as one of the major religions. And there needs to be true inclusivity of people who are practicing that religion in the public sphere. Uh, there was a comment made earlier that there's fear that the more Muslims there are in the armed forces of NATO or in the policy circles, somehow that's going to negatively affect European foreign policy and, and engagement abroad. I think the opposite happens. You have a more committed, civically engaged community that's helping you flesh out these ideas and tackle some very difficult issues and giving you diversity of opinion and credibility when engaging with those. And that's my own experience as a representative of the State Department. I would like to think that people like me and us actually help our country be stronger when we engage abroad with people of different faith, color, and religions. I know I'm out of town, time, but when I listen to you, just you, I'm very big in the gun violence prevention fight, and I can apply what you said to some of our urban areas, the investment in education and employment would make such a difference and in, in more inclusivity, so thank you. I am going to put the committee, the subcommittee, on recess for one half hour, and uh, we will come back and hopefully have, uh, there's been some very profound statements made. Uh, I'd, I'd certainly like to hear uh, some comments on them, and, uh, but uh, we'll be back in one half hour. Uh, this committee is in recess.
to the floor where I had an amendment on the floor and it would not have been, uh, I, I, I wouldn't have been able to be brought up unless I was there and I want to thank all of you for uh, joining us today and, and being understanding of this hectic schedule. Uh, we had a, a very uh, lively discussion uh, and uh, I would like Dr. Hansen to be able to, and uh, perhaps uh, Dr. Verbtech uh, as well to have a chance to comment on what we were saying before. So, Dr. Hansen. I think that we have to be precise in the nomenclature when we talk about, uh, it, was, it was mentioned violence, violence is endemic in any society, but there's such a thing called politically motivated violence. And the statistics suggest that of politically motivated violence with an agenda to further a political cause in Europe and the United States, most of them, most of the incidents in the last two decades or since 9-11 have been is so-called Islamic inspired. <laughs> That's what the per perpetrators have suggested. Second is that a, a minority of uh, Muslims are prone to violence. I think that's correct. But when you're working with a pool of five million over the last decade that have migrated, or you have a million point seven in Europe, just one percent of that pool would be 50,000 people. So that's something to watch. You can be successful in 99 percent of the case, but if you have a, a group of people who feel alienated from society and are prone to radical Islamic doctrine, then that's a large pool given the European, I think, inexperience and inability to assimilate in the fashion that we do. That's the point. I think when we talk about hate crimes, we have to be very specific. The, if you go to the FBI statistics, the group that's most subject to hate crime violence are Amer American Jews in the United States of Jewish faith. At least according to FBI statistics, the group that's most identified with per perpetrating those hate crimes are Islamic uh, zealots. So it's not, sp it's not accurate to say that American Jews uh, are not the most, uh, they are the most targeted group, at least according to federal statistics. And uh, again, I don't think that the United States, uh, given our rela long relation with Europe, very ironic because Europe is used to lecturing us, but I don't think we're in a position to alter fundamentally European policy. What our, our prerogative and our duty is to do is to protect us and this question has affected the NATO alliance, especially the southern flank with tensions with Turkey and Greece over immigration. It's affected the cohesion of the EU. It's, confect, it's affected NATO contributions. It's especially, and I think we haven't talked about this, it's made Eastern Europeans far more susceptible to the propaganda of Vladimir Putin, who is appealing in a populist sense. If you go to Greece today, you can see that he's the most popular figure there. And his message is a nationalist, populist, orthodox, Christendom message that appeals to people who feel that their own elites in the U EU do not listen to what are often legitimate uh, worries about the ability to assimilate and intervene. And finally, um, I think it's sort of disingenuous to talk about second generation as if that is not connected with the first generation immigration pattern. If you look at Boston, Massacres. If you look at Orlando, if you look at San Bernardino, if you look at Fort Hood, we have a reoccurring pattern of second generation Muslims who have been alienated or radicalized and have committed acts of terrorism. So the problem is again with assimilation, integration, intermarriage. And historically throughout society across time and space, if you want to assimilate people and you want to integrate them and you want to intermarry them and make them part of the body politic, then you don't have problems in the second generation, which are mo most of the terrorist incidents that are connected with radical Islam in Europe are second generation because of the failure. And we know how we facilitate that process of Americanization, and that is by numbers that are manageable, legal, and meritocratic and diverse. We want immigrants from all over the world because having influxes from one particular place or one particular group and not having them uh, live among the population in a dispersed manner, it, it makes it much more difficult. Uh, Dr. Verbeck. Thank you, Chairman. Um, 
I would like just like to um, talk a little bit about something that I read about Germany and German schools and canteens to illustrate the problem that I feel is with integration. Um, in German schools, some of the German schools are dropping pork from menu altogether, and this is because they have a few Muslim kids. Now, I'm not suggesting that um, there should be forceful assimilation, the sense of forcing Muslim kids to eat pork, but I don't see why German schools wouldn't offer a variety of choices so that you know the Muslim the Muslim kids take their I know lamb or vegetarians take their vegetarian meal and those German students who want to eat pork they eat pork and they could all eat this together in a canteen but instead we have a situation there were a few Muslim students that the German schools drop pork from menu altogether for fear of offending minority and i uh, and this is the point that i'm trying to make and this is the issue of toleration um, in um, liberal democracies, we sometimes push this issue of toleration to the extreme. And when we push it to the extreme, we don't actually um, encourage toleration as in this case. Um, th and uh, by the way, the issue came to, uh, to the attention of the lawmakers in Schleswig-Holstein, which is one of the German provinces. We wanted to keep pork on the menu. Um, I also, uh, going back to this issue that I see the problem between two models. One is liberal multiculturalism. We try to integrate minorities within this framework of, um, I exceeded my time, is that correct? No, no, go ahead. go ahead. When we try to integrate minorities within this liberal framework, the other is, uh, pluralist multiculturalism, where there is um, uh, separate minorities where we set up uh, parallel societies. And the problem with the issue of toleration, when you push it to the extreme, it, come, it gets to the being a politics of indifference. We don't interfere with these communities, and we, we permit ultimately certain practices that don't stimulate integration, and where we end up with both liberal and illiberal elements. I will end here. That's a fascinating analysis. Time. Thank you, Mr. Simcox. The only, yeah, the, the, the points I, I would make, um, on the, first of all, on the, on the kind of the nature of the threat, it's certainly true that in Europe, um, most plots are homegrown in nature. Um, there's, there's, there's a little bit more to that in the, I mean, somebody like Salman Abedi, for example, who was the suicide bomber in Manchester last May, was second generation Libyan, so is a homegrown case, but there's still a refugee element. But, if, but yeah, most, most are homegrown. But some of the numbers I've been doing on this, um, between 2004 and 2017, there was 32 plots in Europe, so eight a year, um, that were perpetrated by refugees and asylum seekers. So it's not an insignificant number, and of course that includes something like Paris, November 2015, um, where there was a, obviously a very large body count. Um, the other point I would make on, on the, the numbers, European experience with uh, integration and assimilation is, is obviously very different to the US. I think the US has always done this much more successfully than we in Europe have, to be honest. And so when I think of a country like Sweden, um, where I, I, was, I was just there the week before last, they took in 163,000 people in 2015 and obviously regard this as that they consider themselves to be a humanitarian superpower and, and that they viewed this as a, a truly as like an, an international obligation per, in terms of what ratio that would be in the US that would be like the US taking in 5.2 million people it's a very significant number in Sweden and Sweden as many in Europe it doesn't really have the experience of making this kind of thing work like you in the US do. So I would just raise that as one of the potential challenges that a lot of European countries are gonna have to deal with. Go for it. So, you know what's interesting is in, in the European countries with the most refugees, you don't necessarily see correlating uh, fear of refugees. So in Germany specifically, right, they took a million Syrians uh, not only was uh, Chancellor Merkel at the end of the day elected to a fourth term, 
Um, but German public opinion of refugees is actually one of the best in Europe. So why is that? I mean, clearly leadership and the political rhetoric is having something to do with it. Um, in a place like Hungary and Bulgaria, where you do have far-right parties who literally were advertising in, on billboards uh, pre-racist um, um, themes against incoming migrants and the threat that will pose to uh, European women specifically, uh, these are societies that have nowhere near the amount of refugees, Muslim refugees, as Germany. Yet the public perception and views are quite negative now. I mean, it's a clear indication to me that also leadership, the rhetoric, the policies play a big role in that. And remember, we're talking about addressing an issue of radicalization potentially. So my question to, to everyone is, do we think that uh, stereotyping, exclusion, uh, demonization, guilty by association will lessen the problem of radicalization or will it address it? And I understand about the fact that maybe there are no more refugees coming right now at the same levels, but the ones that are in Germany, that are in Europe, what's the best way to deal with this situation? They are there right now. It is, quite frankly, um, illegal under international law for those who have been designated as refugees to be refouled to their country of origin without their consent, particularly in places that are um, experiencing war. So this is now the reality. So my, my remarks regarding investing in education, in helping them integrate, in, in entering the labor force, but also in showing them that tolerance truly applies to them as well, is gonna have to be key. And in terms of percentages, God forbid if 50,000 Muslims in Europe were ISIL fo followers. We would have a completely different conversation right now. We're talking about tens. That's what we're talking about. That is the number of actual attacks in the tens. And so it's clearly not 1%. It is 0 .000 of 1%, whether here or abroad. So we gotta assess the problem for what it is, and then when you look at that and compare it to the rise in hate crimes, assaults, by neo-fascist and neo-Nazi groups against Jews, against Muslims, and people of color on both sides of the, the Atlantic, to me, that's, a, that's a, a real worrying trend. And that's why I would really would, would consider it as an emerging you know, threat as well. well. Can you hear me now? Right. I think, uh, well, let's just uh, have Dr. Hansen's uh, response. I think it's a little bit disingenuous because we are seeing- A little louder, Dr. Oh, Hansen. Sorry. Yes. We're seeing the largest out-migration of Jews uh, since World War II to Israel, and there's a good chance that France, within 10 years, if these rates continue, will be, uh, there won't be a sizable uh, Jewish population in France. and it's not just terrorism because it's individual attacks on Jewish people who are obviously identified as Jews, Orthodox Jews. There's areas within Paris, and I think we've all been to places in Rotterdam and Brussels, where if you were to wear a yarmulke, you would be in danger of physical assault. And there's this also, but that's not really the catalyst for that out-migration. It's a sense, and um, my colleague here referred to it, there's a sense that the government has lost the confidence in traditional Western values to, of tolerance and pluralism. We're not talking about chauvinism and prejudice, and I think uh, Representative Meeks made a good point. What we're talking about is the Western tradition that we all understand and tolerate differences in the periphery of culture, but we unite on democracy and constitutional government and transparency and these core Western values. And, and Often in inexperience with this number of migra immigrants or maybe uh, clumsiness, whatever the reason is, European governments have not been able to address this problem in a, a liberal sense. They haven't been able to say, we welcome you to come in here and it's a two-way street. You give up some of your identity as all immigrants do and accept the core Western values and, in it, and that means that if you see people of a different religion or if you're cultural traditions come in conflict with tolerance and plurality, you have to give that up and we can require that as the host country. 
but that hasn't been happening in Europe, and that means that we have to, to deal with it. The other thing is we would like to lecture Europe and say, why don't you look at the United States and see how much better job we do? But that's not the way nations, there's no international court of good manners. So what happens is that we have to make the adjustments of this problem, and this problem is going to affect Turkey's membership in NATO in the short term. It's going to affect whether we, we can deplore racism all we want. I think we should, but there is a schism growing between Eastern and Western Europe, and it's giving Vladimir Putin a lot of opportunities that we don't want, and we have to deal with the world as it is whether than we'd like it to be. So I agree with my colleague on the left that we, we have to reach out. Yes, I mean literally the left, not the idea. <laughs> <laughs> um, See, I could say both of those here. <laughs> <laughs> that by in a geographical yeah. sense, but <laughs> what, I'm, what I'm saying is we have to reach out and try to suggest politely that Europe, and without being chauvinistic, might want to learn from the melting pot tradition that's made us the most diverse country in the world. But in lieu that they might not do that, we have to take security precautions in the United States because I think the EU is seriously uh, facing some existential crisis that are going to affect the national security of our alliances. The, um, let, let's just note we're talking about Western civilization. Uh, we're, we're talking about basically the melting pot theories. We're talking about how uh, people uh, and nationalism these are forces at play that are part of our analysis of what's going to happen, how to approach this moment in history. Uh, and I, am I, I don't think I, well, this is my opinion, that uh, Western civilization has brought more freedom to more people. And the fact that freedom as we know it uh, exists where Western civilization is the dominant force and not uh, Islamic, the Islamic world which, if you look there, I don't know any examples of the democratic institutions that we're talking about and we hold dear Malaysia. as Americans. Yeah. Malaysia? Yeah, it's, uh, okay, there's one, and uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe, uh, maybe Indonesia, maybe, but uh, when I take a look at those countries that are the most Islamic in terms of actually taking their religion so seriously, uh, there's no freedom in those countries, and uh, uh, we also were talking about in terms of the melting pot, uh, I don't see that you can have a uh, melting pot with people who think that they will not meld in with the notions that other people have a right to worship God as they see fit, and uh, if because that is part of the melting pot theory, and you do have, I've, I've seen uh, uh, various opinion polls taken in, in Europe and in London, I believe it was, that suggested that those people, those Islamic people in London, the, that if, well, of all the people who are saying, no, people do not have a right to worship God as they see fit, the one, uh, if it's different than my faith, uh, almost all of them are Muslims and almost none of them are Christians, saying, no, if someone disagrees with me and my faith, they don't have a right to practice it. Almost all the ones who say, well, uh, and, I, and I don't believe that, and Mr. Meeks, just to be fair about it, I, I don't think the interpretation, I mean, I know that we've been told that we have to assume that Islam is a, is a faith of, of peace, uh, and it means, but Islam, to some interpretations, and correct me, you know probably know about this than I do, that, that Islam means submission, the interpretation, the more accurate, sub, uh, interpretation is submission, not peace. And for those who don't submit, that's anything but peace. Is that right? Islam comes from the word salam, and that is peace. That's exactly right. I don't know. Okay. That's exactly right. All right. So uh, the. Uh, uh, In fact, you know, yes. the okay. greeting of Muslims yes. is peace be upon you. Upon it right. is not, All you right. shall submit to me. Yeah, okay. Well, I'm sure that it's, <laughs> is that cutting? I'm sure, okay, I, I, salam alaikum, I'll like that. And uh, uh, okay, well, as uh, I, I will have to admit that I just don't see any countries in the world right now cutting the heads off where Christians are cutting the heads off Muslims, but I have seen the opposite. 
And all I'm saying here is you don't, you, obviously you cannot uh, put all Muslims in one category, but you can realize that when you see things happening, that if that, there is a significant more uh, Muslims doing something that is something you don't want to happen in your society, like refuse to recognize somebody else's right to worship God as they see fit, well then you should be aware of that. That should be something, uh, and also in second generation type of things where we're talking about, yeah, we've had people in our own country, in our own culture, uh, Dr. Hanson, we've had our own people shooting kids up at schools and things that have nothing to do with Islam. But in terms of the Muslim population, the number of Muslims here, uh, and the number of actual uh, situations where second generation Muslims have gone crazy, it's very demonstrable. And uh, I don't know another case like in San Bernardino where you had that and uh, Dr. Hansen, uh you know, basically you have second generation Christians coming here and doing that. I don't remember one case of that happening where someone who's immigrated here from another country and as a Christian or as a Buddhist or some of the other religion, I don't know of one case where the second generation Buddhist or second generation Christian uh, went out and committed these mass murders. Maybe you could enlighten me. I mean, you have fourth, fifth, sixth generation Christians who are committing it. So that's actually even more worrying well, that's skip. That's skipping the skipping the question. Do you have? Do you have? That's getting around the question. So when we have, when we have, for example, you know. Uh, okay. But by the way, when we say a white Christian, no one knows how religious these these people are, or whether they're true believers. In fact, I doubt their faith. If, if they were true Christians, mm -hmm. then they would do this. But that aside, um, you have statistically speaking far more violence by white Christian males in this country, statistically speaking, than any other group. But wait, not And so we're not, what, excuse me, I didn't interrupt you. So what you have is right now um, amplification of, of, of a particular problem. It's a real problem. Terrorism in the name of Islam is a real problem. It needs mm -hmm. to be dealt with. Right. Yeah. Not ignoring that. What we're saying is that are we being fair to the religion and its adherents and people the overwhelming majority of people who condemn it and are looking for real ways to address it. As Americans, as we have to be honest about um, the numbers in this country in terms of the actual attacks that have happened by which groups and address them accordingly. And from, from Oklahoma City to the mail bombs in Austin just a few weeks ago to Charlottesville, clearly other people are also committing. The Waffle House that happened just a few yeah. days ago mm -hmm. to the horrible school shootings that. And, and which ones of those were motivated by religion? They were all Christian. No, they so weren't religion. We, they weren't based, based on anybody's how do we know, religion. But how do we know that the Muslims did them because of religion and not just because they were horrible okay. people That's or fair. they had mental illness? Well, I think that there has been uh, indication. Dr. Hansen, you want to say that? Then I'll let Mr. Meeks go. We don't know, we don't know how disingenuous anybody is who commits a crime, but we can only go on the pretext of what they say. And it's a, fa it's a matter of fact that violent incidents that have a political agenda that it, the perpetrators have identified themselves as self-appointed representatives of Islam, and we don't have corresponding numbers. In a country that's about 80 percent self-identified as Christian, we don't have corresponding numbers of people who commit violence against people who are not Christian because of a Christian identity. That's just a fact. So to say most Oklahoma people, City is a people, political bombing. No, they're not, it was not a Christian bombing. Political terrorist bombing, in it fact. It was not a Christian bombing against non-Christians. When we go outside this building, most, of the, people, without a most of the people, you, go, go ahead, you Dr. Hansen. not to interrupt, I okay. request the same courtesy from you. When we go outside this building, most of the people today who commit traffic accidents, most of the people who jaywalk will be Christian. So that citation means almost nothing in a predominantly Christian country. What we're talking about is politically motivated violence where people who self-identify with, even if they misuse the religion, with a particular religion against people they feel mm -hmm. are enemies of that religion. What about Serbanisa? I'm talking about inside the United well, States. We're okay, about well, even in the United States, <laughs> if I can. So where 10,000 Muslims were butchered by fundamentalist Christians in Serbia. Yeah. But, but in the name of religion. That's absolutely, that's. 
That's absolutely but, correct. But, but even in the United so, States. You know. Yes. Uh, and, Mr. Meeks. And I, and, has the, and Mr. Meeks has the facts. <laughs> let me, let me, let me just say this. I see. Because I've got to go. Mr. Meeks has the floor. Because even in the United States, the Ku Klux Klan identified themselves as Christians. And they believed in the Bible. Slavery. The slave masters said that they could enslave people in Christianity, in the name of Christ. They believed that's what they did. Do you talk to white nationalists today? They will tell you they're acting in the same manner as the Bible calls for, that slavery is okay because it's in the Bible. I've met and talked to them. When I was raised, you know, my parents raised in the South, and not within my lifetime, a lot of what they've done was in the name of Christianity and justified what they did by being Christians. Now, in response also, though, to this whole, you know, I, I think, Mr. Robaka, what you just indicated, uh, in regards to, you know, this nation or that nation, you know, uh, uh, they don't have Western principles, et cetera. Well, let me just say this. Even democracy, because for me and my father, they didn't have democracy in America. So democracy is not just something that's out there. For most, you know, I can recall um, uh, being in South Carolina and my grandfather, my father, my mother not being able to vote. I can recall being told I had to get underneath the bed as my grandfather got on the porch with a shotgun because folks who went to church on Sunday morning were now coming March to come to get the so-called uh, end people. This is in my lifetime that I've witnessed. And then you also talk about democracies uh, in many of these other places. These places were places that were colonized by the West. And brutal dictators were put in place to keep them in order. And this is less than 50, 60 years ago. They were colonies of Western democracies. And there were certain things that was done to put, and so some of what you, you, have, have, what you talk about was put into place to keep them in certain controls. Whether you talk about the Middle East, whether you talk about Asia, whether you talk about Africa, all of these places were colonized by Western so-called democracies. If you look at our country, 25, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, in the end of, this was the wild, wild west. All kind of craziness was going on. And so now we're 240 years later, and there's still problems. So to go after some other country who has a new democracy, basically an infant, and try to compare it to the democracy of the United States, of which is still needs a lot of work, to me is like comparing apples to oranges. And what we need to be doing, in one sense, I mean, people are, what, one of the things that we have in common is our, we're all a human. No matter what our race or religion, we're human. And so we should be focusing on the human problems. And people leave from one area to another because there is a human problem that exists. And so they all want, that's why I utilize my family's experience as an example of people trying to go someplace else, wouldn't leave. My parents would have never left South Carolina if they had an opportunity there. Never would have left. I still would have been, I might have been a member from South Carolina instead of New York. But they left because they needed an opportunity. They wanted to a place that they thought they could have a better life for them, their families. So it's the same thing when you have a lot of individuals, who, they're not leaving uh, uh, Syria just because they want to leave Syria? They're leaving Syria for a reason. In fact, that was one of my questions. You know, sometimes it's easy for us to say, go bomb. But there's consequences because we don't look at the human lives that are affected by the bombing. The, 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 the women and children and men who are innocent who just wanted to continue, they leave because that, they, they're not there because leaving because there's some kind of religious something. Their homes are bombed. There's no place for them to go or to eat. They're starving. So if that, the bombing didn't take place, we wouldn't have had some of the situation. I mean, one of the questions I had, you know, I was going to ask 
Mr. Alzheimer, the, the, what role did the Russia bombing of Aleppo have in forcing migration of hundreds of thousands of people to Turkey? Did it play a role or not? It was a huge and direct role. Uh, I was the outreach coordinator for Ambassador Robert Ford with the Syrian communities, really, activists, NGOs, and opposition members as well, and our allies in Europe, particularly, who were working on this. And as soon as the Russians started bombing, they were bombing, sp they were not bombing the terrorists. They were not bombing ISIL. They were not bombing Al-Qaeda. They were bombing civilians who were opposed to Bashar al-Assad and what we term the Free Syria Army groups with all of their you know, imperfections. And there was a direct correlation. So that when they were bombing Aleppo, they were bombing the areas around Homs in northern Syria and other areas, you saw massive movement hundreds of thousands of people pushing into Turkey. At the time, Turkey had almost close to two million people by then. And so they released the valves to let people go into Europe. And that is the European mig migration crisis. In a sense, it was weaponized against Europe. That's what happened. I know that Ambassador Hansen has to leave. But I do too. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, I would just, if I could make a concluding remark. Yeah, I, I think we, we, the sins of Mankind, or, or what Representative Meeks enunciated, every country has had that history, in Western or non -Western. What's unique about the West is it has a tradition of self-critique, self-examination, it rectified. The FBI destroyed the Klan in the 1960s, and so even Klan Watch and Southern Poverty Law Center now have branched out into other areas of hatred because the country healed itself, it had a debate, it, it found the right course. And that process of self-introspection is why people from the Muslim world and the non-West come to the West. And so it's the height of irony that people are coming to uh, the West for freedom and for diversity and self-critique. And then when they arrive, the host has lost the confidence in its own traditions to say to them, we, you came here for a reason. It wasn't just economic opportunity. You wanted respect of an individual. So all we require of you is that you adopt the customs and the traditions that are not perfect, but we don't have to be perfect to be good. And we have a unique tradition of self-critique and change. And that's all I think we're trying to suggest is that Europe's problem is that for some reason, we don't have time to get into it, it has not been able to tell its immigrant population that you have to assimilate, not change your food, your religion, your fashion, your cultural pride and traditions, but to accept a body of tolerance for everybody who believes or looks or acts in a different way. And I, I know that minority of immigrants may be small, but the, the pool is large enough that a very small minority can be very volatile in a country like Europe that doesn't have our experience with assimilation and immigration. I'm going to I'm gonna have to excuse myself. <laughs> Thank you very much for having us, both of you. I won't take two minutes. I, I would just make the point, um, reiterate the point really, that uh, the European, what applies to the US doesn't necessarily apply to Europe. You've had the, exp the, the melting pot in the US has never worked in, in Europe in the, in the same way. And so I, I would just encourage us not to, not to view these two situations as, as entirely analogous. Of course, the situation in Syria, I mean, there's no doubt it's horrendous, horrendous what has happened in Syria and there has to be a response from the international community. The response I d uh, is an irresponsible re response, I believe, to say that Europe should be the home for millions of people that it didn't have the chance to vet, and that somehow if it, Europe doesn't do that, it's, being, it's not living up to its international commitments or is somehow uh, being unreasonable. This is a very, very difficult situation for Europe integration has been failing in Europe for some time. So adding millions more people into the mix is, is, is obviously the humanitarian impulse is there, but we can't wish away the problems that that sort of thing can create. So I would just encourage us all to be at least aware of that and, and not necessarily think of this as, as being just like the US experience. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I I would agree that um, the terror acts are committed by a small group of people. But what we are really talking about is what is the fact. 
and de fact um, on European societies and European politics has been tremendous. And this is what we worry about, um, how the Europe is changing politically and the divisions within the Europe, and this is not good for Europe. Um, Russia is certainly going to exploit this. Yes. And, um, and also I want to say what I started talking, I think Dr. Hansen um, um, took it over, and this is really that the European societies need to have more confidence and make demands on the minorities clear demands for integration, not for assimilation, but for integration and for respect of the liberal traditions. And um, I think that would be also a big uh, contribution towards um, having more uh, cohesive societies in Europe and towards eliminating some of the problems we are talking about here. Clearly, this is a, you know, it's a difficult issue. Um, these societies are dealing with um, really, um, you know, frustrating dynamics. Um, we're all humans, and we hate change, and we also don't like insecurity, and Europeans have had to deal with that. Um, the question is, what is the best way to deal with it? And, and my argument is uh, really based on our own experience here in the United States. Uh, integration cannot be forced. It's when you try to force it, you get some of that toxicity. People have to want to be French, to want to be German, and most of them do. That's what I'm trying to point out. Actually, most of them do. 94% said they felt connected to the country. 75% are intermingling with other religions. So I don't know about that whole statement that they're not doing that. They are, these are the facts. Um, and how we approach the subject is extremely important because half of the Muslim population in Europe is under the age of 30. Um, forcing them will not work. It will not work. Engaging them, investing in educating them, and removing institutional discriminatory barriers in society, particularly the educational system, encouraging them to, to, to be public servants, civil servants, diplomats, police officers, uh, soldiers of their native countries is one of the best ways, or let them do whatever they want. They don't have to be held to any higher standard, but it's that freedom to express their religiosity as long as all of them support the tenets and the principles of the Western European order. Freedom, respect of the individual, absolutely. It's what every human being, irrespective of their religion, deserves. And so I thank you for the opportunity today you know, we're not going to resolve this today, but, but uh, anything that will help people abroad and make us safe here, uh, we're game for it. So thank you for inviting us. Well, thank all of you, and I will uh, uh, reserve the final statement for the chairman. And, uh, but I did appreciate uh, the, the lively discussion that we had. And Mr. Meeks and I are very close friends, so don't let it think that because he gets excited, and I may get excited at times, that we uh, are anything but very good friends and respect each other's opinion. Uh, with that said, um, I think that, uh, as I say, the, the issues that, that are at the heart of this discussion has something to do also with how you value Western civilization and whether or not you believe that the influx coming in from uh, the Middle East that's going into Europe today will in some way diminish Western civilization's influence on humanity. And I have to say that I think, I believe that that is what is happening. No matter what we can say about vetting and, what, and how we're, that might be the goals, et cetera, that in the end what we will see is a diminishing of the influence on, on, on humankind uh, of what we call Western civilization. I think that to the degree that you've got nationalism at play in Eastern Europe and elsewhere in Europe, it's that these people, and like the Poles, for example, who were instrumental in defeating 
the Muslim uh, advance into Europe and, and, and stop them at Vienna. They, that's something they're very proud of there. And I can see where that, that is part of their framework. They say, we will defend Western civilization. And that's their nationalism that it's an expression of their nationalism. I think that's probably true with the Hungarians, it's probably true with, uh, with these other countries that we're talking about. Now, whether or not uh, this influx from, uh, in a very trying situation where people desperately are trying to escape a war zone, whether or not that is something that is uh, more important to take care of them than in other people's view, than to preserve the Western civilization only if that does not in some way threaten it. But I believe a lot of people do believe it's a threat and do believe that there will be a major impact on their way of life. And I think that that's not an irrational thing, although I think you've made a really good case today. I'm seriously, you've, you've done a really good job of presenting thoughtful uh, uh, you know, challenges to what I just said, which is fine. I mean, that's fine. And uh, uh, I will say that uh, I do not think nationalism is a bad thing, but it can be a bad thing. I mean, obviously, Adolf Hitler was a bad guy. And, uh, but to the degree if nationalism is used as it is in the United States to say we are Americans and we believe in this, we believe in freedom, uh, that's different. That is a different thing. And uh, if we have people who, it's not racial, but, but people who come in but have another faith from what Western civilization has done for the United States, which has been, been pr predominantly a Christian, Western-oriented population from early on. Uh, when we, yeah, we stole it from the Indians, I admit it, okay, there's no doubt about that. But by and large, the people who came to the United States were uh, Christians who were, uh, who came here seeking freedom and uh, but they all weren't required, for example, uh, where, there, where there were a lot of Catholics around, uh, they didn't outlaw the eating of meat on Friday. And when I was younger, I remember, uh, uh, I remember that the, the Catholics didn't eat meat on Friday. Now, I understand that's been changed now, uh, but when I, I remember that very well. No, at no time did uh, Catholics advocate that in their town that they not sell or eat, or eat meat on Friday. This, there's, there's something there that indicates that when you're taking a poll, and I, again, I wish I had the poll here to show you, but that it indicates that there are, that, that, that those people who adamantly believe in Islam are willing to say that other people should not have that right to, to make their choices. Um, I think that's why you saw these uh, beheadings that would happen in the Middle East. And in terms of the number of people who are suffering there, a lot of it, you're right, it has nothing to do with Islam. It has everything to do with power grabs by power mongers. Uh, I, uh, uh, I, I will have to say this about Assad. I think he's no better or worse than the other dictators there, whether they call themselves kings or royal families or just the power brokers or whatever, it is, whatever title they've given themselves. When someone challenges them, they slaughter the opposition. And that's one thing that I think uh, uh, is not acceptable. And, uh, but it also may mean that we should not necessarily be jumping into that whole can of worms and mm -hmm. thinking that we're gonna start giving the orders and, and, and telling people how to solve the problem because I think it's gonna be a long time before that problem is solved. Now with that said, I'm sorry for going on. I just wanna thank all of you. I, I think there's been, uh, we didn't come to any conclusion, but I think the, this has been very provocative today. So thank you, and uh, this hearing is adjourned. <laughs>